Okay, let me start again. Okay, good morning, everyone. Dr. Nat here. So we are going to continue with our statistics class, uh, ENG 3004-6. Hopefully, you're in the right class. So um, we talked about discrete uniform distribution, binomial distribution, Poisson distribution, and also geometric distribution. Can anyone tell me like the property for each of these distribution, just like um, at the top of your mind? What do you remember about this distribution at least? Anyone wants to try? What do you guys remember? No one remembers anything? Okay, so the easiest one I think is geometric. What does it describe? Oh, I, th I think I have something in the chat. Shami said Poisson is for small probability and very big number of trials. Correct, that's good. So Poisson is for big N and small P. I think this was the uh, notation for the parameters that they use. Big N and small P. What about geometric distribution? What does this distribution describe? No one remembers? Okay, binomial. Binomial is the easiest. I'm just changing the terms here. So binomial is the easiest. Supposedly. So what does it tell you? What does binomial tell you? Or what is the property of binomial? It has to have at least, it has to have only what? By, what does by tell you? Two. Two. Two what? Two outcomes. Two outcomes. Thank you. So two outcomes only, success and failure. Which is success and also failure. And what about um, Poisson relation to binomial? What is the relation between Poisson and binomial, if you guys still remember? Okay, so Poisson is basically an extension of binomial, but uh, they have the same parameter, N and P, but uh, Poisson has a very big N and a very small P, which gives us another parameter, which is what? From N and P, what do we get for, for Poisson? What's the notation? So everyone's like, oh my God, I don't remember anything. You should remember, you're supposed to revise. Okay, so let's look at a Poisson. Okay, so Poisson is, where is it? So we're going to talk about this one, yes. So X distribution, X is a random variable that has a distribution of Poisson and the notation is lambda. Lambda is NP. Remember, Poisson is an extension of binomial. That is why it still has that NP parameter. Binomial has, is like this, bin NP. Poisson uses these numbers and creates a new parameter or a notation, which is lambda or just mean. You can call it the mean or lambda, either way. Okay, so the equations, you don't have to memorize it. It's going to be given in the exam. Hey, doctor. Yes. Sorry to interrupt, but are you writing something? Yes. Oh, I, I did not share my screen. Wait. What are you guys seeing now? What are you guys uh, seeing now? Uh, your, what is your screen showing? Like the first slide of module 8. Oh, the first slide. Okay, okay. So no wonder everyone's like blur. Okay, share screen. Okay, so I was talking about this. Thank you for letting me know. Oh my God. 
So um, poisson is given by the lambda notation. So when a random variable x has a poisson distribution, it is described by this parameter lambda and poisson is an extension of binomial. Therefore, it still uses the parameters from binomial, which is NP. Lambda is equal to NP. So that is the relationship between binomial and Poisson. And then we also talked about geometric. Okay, geometric. Okay, so geometric tells you, um, let the random variable X denote the number of trials until the first success. So this is what geometric distribution tells you. Um, what, so you have an event and you are wondering when does the first event, when does the first success occur? So geometric distribution tells you that. And then what else? The first one, which is supposed to be the easiest one. Well, I, tell, I say everything is easy, which is the discrete uniform distribution. It has the same probability for all its random variable. So it, they all have the same value. And this is what it looks like. I'm supposed to have a graph, oh, okay, it's here. So this is the probability, this is the random variable, and they all have the same probability. So these are discrete distribution. So now we're going to look at continuous and hopefully make some relation, relation to discrete so that we don't have a lot to memorize. So stop sharing. I'm going to share my module A. Any questions about the discrete one? Is everyone okay? No, this is not it. Stop sharing. Don't see. Share screen. Are you guys seeing module number eight? Yes, doctor. Okay. Yes, doctor. Thank you. All right, so for today's topic, we are going to cover these four, sorry, these three, which is the continuous uniform distribution, continuous normal distribution, continuous exponential distribution. So, um, and then we have applications in engineering to show uh, how we use this in real life. Okay. So the name continuous uniform distribution looks familiar, at least this part. We had previously discrete uniform distribution. So we already know that discrete uniform distribution has the same probability for all its random variable. So this is what we know. But for continuous, I am expecting that I have the same probability between interval A up to interval B, because this is supposed to be continuous. Remember continuous, there is no gap in the random variable. The number is continuous. Therefore, you describe the number as an interval rather than one, two, three, four, like discrete. This is your x, this is your x, and this is your probability, or fx or px, either way. This one's Usually we write it as Px and this one we, we write it as Fx. But you can just say it's probability and it is understood. Okay, so continuous uniform distribution, we are expecting a uniform distribution. The word uniform tells us that the probability is supposed to be the same. So let's look at it. Okay, so continuous uniform distribution is the simplest of all continuous distribution in statistics. It is characterized by density function that is flat in a closed interval like this one. So here they already give you the equation for uniform distribution, continuous uniform distribution. And you have the word, sorry, you have the notation A and also B. And here you have one over B minus A, which tells you that the probability is supposed to be this equation, one minus, sorry, one over B minus A. And this is your random variable. And this is your probability. The same um, graph that we have seen from the beginning of class, right? So uh, it is described by 1 over b, b minus a. And this only applies when x is between or equal from a to b, less than or equal to b. 
and everywhere else, meaning to say this region and this region, the distribution will be zero. The mean and variance is given by this equation, a plus b over two, and the variance is b minus a squared over 12. So the, there's suddenly a 12 there, but there is proof to get to this point. If you're interested to see the proof, look at your textbook that you are referring to. They include the proof usually at the appendix. Okay, so, so if I have an interval that goes from, let's say, 5 to 12, my random variable goes from 5 to 12. That, what does this tell me? That the random variable can be 5.1, 5.2, 5.3, 5.4, or even 5.15, 5.16. So all the numbers within this interval is fair game as your random variable because there is no gap between the random variable. There is no gap in the numbers. So we have an interval between 5 to 12. And I want to know what is the probability for this uh, distribution. So I would say I would calculate 1 over B would be the maximum 12 minus 5. So 12 minus 5 is 7. So the probability would be 1 over 7. And A would be 5. And B would be 12. So this is how I plot my graph. Okay, and the same case for our mean. Our A is 5. Our B is 12 divided by 2. This will be your mean. And B minus A, 12 minus 5, will be 7. 7 squared is 49 divided by 12, whatever this value is. Okay, so that was probability density function, or we can short form this as PDF. We have seen this before, PDF, and we also have seen cumulative distribution function, or CDF. So the appendix that we refer to when we're talking about cumulative distribution function, they usually abbreviate it as CDF, so don't get confused about that. The cumulative distribution function of a continuous uniform random variable is obtained by integration. So basically, if your interval is from A to B, basically if your interval is from A to B, you would integrate from the minimum up to X unknown because you, you can select whatever X that you want and A up to X one over B minus A. So you are integrating the PDF inside here and you are integrating uh, with respect to du and then x over basically you're just integrating this and whatever that you would get is actually your cumulative distribution function since they have the same denominator you can just simplify this to x minus a b minus a so the cumulative distribution function for this distribution is zero when x is less than a and it is x minus a over b minus a when x is between these values. And when x is equal or greater than b, it is 1. Okay, so how do we relate this to discrete? How do we relate this to discrete? So remember that we talked about p when x is equal to 1, probability when x is equal to 2. We're talking about discrete here. Let me write that over here so you don't get confused. And this is continuous. Okay, so Px equals to 3, Px equals to 4. And remember, if you have a probability mass function, uh, these values in total should be equal to 1. So let's say this is 0 0.1, this is 0 0.3, 0 0.2, and then this is 0 0.4. So the total would be 1. So we, but we don't really care about that as long as the total is one. Okay, um, it can be any number. So now I want to talk about the cumulative. This is PDF. Now I, I want to talk about the CDF for discrete. So when we were talking about CDF, remember that we had to add the numbers. So if X is less than one, X is less than one, which is the minimum interval, then your probability would be zero. Let me write that as fx equals to zero. <clears throat> and if your x is greater than one, uh, sorry, if your x is greater than, I don't remember how to write it. 
if your x is greater than one and less than less than two. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, x is less greater than one and less than two. Less than two, it's not equal to two yet. It's greater than or equal to one and it is less than two, which means that it has not reached two yet. Therefore, your probability would be 0 0.1. And if your x is greater than and equal to two, but is less than three, sorry, it doesn't work like that. It's less than three. Okay, so fx is going to be the summation of 0 0.1 and 0 0.3. So that would be 0 0.4. And you would add these up until you, you get one. So 0 0.1 plus 0 0.3 plus 0 0.2, you would get um, 0 0.6. And then you would add 0 0.1, 0 0.3 plus 0 0.2 plus 0 0.4, and you would get one eventually when fx is uh, equal and equal to four, sorry, equal and greater to four, right? This is when your x is equal to or greater to four, which means that it is at the end of the interval. So this was discrete. It is the same case for continuous, except that you have to integrate. But here they already give you the equation so that you don't have to integrate. You can just use the equation as it is. But previously we had to integrate, okay? So let's look at how we can apply this equation. So hopefully everyone can make the relationship between the discrete and continuous. So discrete has PDF, it has CDF. Continuous also has PDF and also CDF. What is the PDF for our continuous? It is one over B minus A. When you integrate the PDF, you would get the CDF. You had your PX for discrete, the summation of px would become your cdf. Same case over here. When you are integrating, you are basically summing up the area under the curve. That is what it means when you integrate. Okay, moving on. So example number one. Suppose that a large conference room for a certain company can be reserved, reserved for no more than four hours. However, the use of the conference room is such that both long and short conferences occur quite often. So they're saying that the duration of these conferences are not fixed. Sometimes it's short, sometimes it's long. In fact, it can be assumed that length X or the duration of a conference has a uniform distribution on the interval of zero to four. So now they, they're saying that it has a uniform distribution um, for all of the duration, let's say, Let's just write the, let's just try to plot this first. So this is our X and this is our probability over here. And we know that the conference has a random variable between interval zero to four. So zero does not start there, so my bad. So zero starts here and up to four and it would have a uniform distribution or a flat line Okay, up to here. And we want to know what is this value. This is our unknown. What is the probability density function? And what is the probability that any given conference lasts at least three hours? So let's do number A first. What is the probability density function? Now, if you look at this graph, you're going to get, uh, I think you're going to get a little bit confused. But if you're not confused, that's good. Because we have seen this type of graph for our CDF. Remember we had this one and it went up and it was like this and it went up and like this. This was our cumulative distribution function for our module number six or number five, if I'm not mistaken. But for our continuous random distribution, sorry, continuous uniform distribution, it has this straight line, but there's no jumping. There's no jumping like this one. There's no step. There's no step function. So uh, don't get confused between the two. This is a probability distribution uh, function for a continuous uniform distribution. So that's a lot to remember. 
Okay, 1 over B minus A is our PDF, remember? So 1 over 4 minus 0. So it's basically just 1 over 4 or 0 0.25. So the number over here would be 0 0.25 and my graph is already complete. Okay, um, what is the probability that any given conference lasts at least three hours? So when we're talking about at least, uh, three has to be the minimum. So X must be greater or equal to three, at least three hours. So it, it's going to be three, four or more. But in this case, our interval only extends up to four. So there's basically just three and four. So now we're trying to find out what is three, sorry, what is x greater or equal to three? So let's look at the solution. So what is the probability density function? One over four between this interval zero, uh, x is between zero to four and it is zero elsewhere. What is the probability that given conference lasts at least three hours, x is greater or equal to three? Therefore, you would need to integrate between three to four because your interval only goes up to four and they're asking you for the minimum, which is three. So you integrate your PDF that you got from here. Remember, if you integrate your PDF, you would get CDF, your cumulative distribution function. So whenever they ask you at least three hours or greater than or less than, basically they're talking about CDF. It's either one minus CDF or just the CDF itself. Okay, so here we are integrating our PDF from the minimum or from the X that they are giving us up to the maximum. So X to max. And PDF is one over four. So you just integrate this, you could get one, sorry, X over four. And this goes from three to four. So four minus three over four is just, one over four, okay? So that's pretty easy. What is the tricky part over here is knowing how to write this. You have to remember how to write this. If I ask you what is the probability density function, do not just give me one over four like that. You have to write it like this because one over four only applies from zero to four. So if you are not going to give me uh, something like this form, you will plot it. At least I know you understand that it goes from only zero to four interval, right? So if you plot like this and you indicate from zero to four and you put it 20, 0 0.25 here, I know that you understand that this is a uniform distribution function, even though you didn't write it like this because everywhere else is zero, okay? Any questions about this one? Everyone's okay so far? Okay. So far, everything okay. All right, thank you. Moving on. If you have any questions, you can write it in the chat box or you can just ask me directly. Please interrupt, interrupt the class. Uh, I don't mind. Okay, so moving on. So that was a continuous uniform distribution. We tried to relate it with the discrete. I uh, And I mentioned to you that it is not uh, the probability density function for the continuous uniform distribution has a straight line, but it is not a cumulative uh, distribution function that we saw back in um, random variables early on. Okay, so please make that distinction, don't get confused. So moving on to the next distribution, which is normal distribution, the most important and most widely used. Yes, correct. Because we use normal distribution all the time, if you, don't know this, your grades are based on normal distribution. Um, how we, um, what else? I would think the, the easiest one that I can relate to is your grades. Whenever you um, do an exam, I would get a normal distribution and this part would be B, which means that the most of you guys would get a B. The probability of students getting a B is the highest and this would be your A and this would be your fail or D. So the probability of students failing is very, very low. The probability of students getting an A plus or A is very, very low. But the average lies in the center, which is at grade B, something like that. But if let's say 
your normal distribution is at a C. Let's just talk about this. If you if the average of the class is at a C, uh, I would shift the grade to, to B. So basically, um, if everyone has an average at C, it means that the test question was too hard or I did not um, present the content to you accurately or efficiently. Therefore, there is a mistake somewhere in the delivery or in the learning process. So I would shift the grade uh, to a higher grade. Or if everyone is getting an A, I would shift the grade to a B. So it works both ways. Okay, so let's talk about what normal distribution is. Okay, so often it is referred to Gaussian distribution. I think you learn about this in other classes as well, maybe math three. Its graph called the normal curve is the bell-shaped curve, which describes approximately many phenomena that occur in nature, industry, and also research. So this is the normal curve, which describes approximately many phenomena. Okay, this is just repeating itself. So here you have two parameters that you need to be aware of. You have your mean, and you also have your standard deviation. So let's look at it in more detail. So if x is a random variable whose probability density function is normal with mean mu and variance of this guy, we write it as x has a distribution of, has a normal distribution, mu variance. A random variable x uh, is given by this equation, one over two pi, standard deviation times e to the power of this guy, and x extends between zero, minus infinity up to infinity, and is a normal random variable with parameters mu, where mu is also between minus infinity to infinity, and your standard deviation must be always greater than zero. It's not from minus infinity to infinity. It's always a positive number. Also, your mean is given by mu and your variance is given by that symbol. The distribution of a normal, dis normal random variable with mean zero and variance is called a standard normal distribution. So how does that look like? So I told you that the graph looks like this and you know that in the middle we have our mean, it extends vertically. If your mean is equal to zero, and you have a variance equal to one, we would call this distribution as a standard normal distribution, the word standard. Typically, you can just call it normal distribution, but when I say standard normal distribution, it specifically means that your mean is equal to zero and your variance is equal to one, because this is not always the case. Like I told you before, your mean can be a uh, grade of B or grade of B equals to, or is it 70 to 80, if I'm not mistaken? So 70 to 80 is your mean, let's say 75 is your mean. So your mean is not always equal to zero. Sometimes it's another number. So we'll look at that as well. Okay, so here is a normal curve with the mean mu two is greater than mu one. So again, mu is just a number, it's the mean. If your mean is shifted or your mean is greater, it shifts the curve. So as you can see over here, your mu2 is greater than mu1. Therefore, the curve lies here. The peak must be aligned with your mean always. This is the normal distribution. The maximum peak must be aligned with your mean. Okay, what about the, the standard deviation? The standard deviation in this case is equal. Therefore, you can see that it has a similar shape, only the mean is shifted. Okay, what about normal curves with a similar mean but different uh, standard deviation? So here we have the similar mean, which means that the maximum must be aligned at the mean. So we have our maximum over here aligned at the mean. We have our maximum for the second curve also aligned at the mean. And then our standard deviation mu2 sorry, mu, this is not mu, standard deviation two is greater than standard deviation one. So standard deviation two is greater, this one is greater, and this is smaller. Now I had a question in the exam, I asked you, which one is better? Is it a higher variance or a smaller variance? 
What's the answer? Smaller variance. Smaller variance. What was the justification for that? Anyone? It remember? deviate less than uh, the higher variance. The value deviate less. Yes, basically it, we have a more accurate uh, data because it is more closer to the mean. That was the justification. This is the same case. When we have a smaller standard deviation, it is closer to the mean. When we have a greater standard deviation, it is far away from the mean, which means that your data is spread out. Remember we talked about a data being spread out or like close to the mean. If it is spread out, your data is basically all over the place and not very accurate, but it's still data. It's not, it's not to say that it's wrong. It's just a different form of data. When it is close to the mean, you know that, oh, it's approximately close to the mean. Therefore, it is very predictable. So we, we typically like data like that, that is very predictable. We don't really like data that is unpredictable and very spread out. Okay, so a smaller standard deviation is better because it is closer to the mean. Our data is less spread out. Okay, so here, figure five, this is a normal curve with mu one uh, being less than mu two. We know what mu is, it is the mean. So basically mu two is greater, so it is shifted to the right. And then we have um, standard deviation two is greater. You know that it is going to be spread out. So spread out, and um, this is the shape. We have seen this shape earlier, spread out. And this is close to the mean because it has a smaller standard deviation. Now, the question is, why do it, they have different heights? Why do they have different heights? Okay, the answer is because the area under the curve must always equal to one only. Remember, we're talking about probability here. The maximum probability that you can have is basically one. So the area under one curve must be equal to one only. So if you are going to stretch the curve, something has to be uh, decreased, something has to decrease, right? So if you are going to stretch it this way, it has to decrease in height. If you are going to uh, compress it, it can go uh, up in height because the total area under the curve is always equal to one. If something has to compensate, for uh, the other parameter that is expanding or decreasing. Okay, so I hope that makes sense for everyone. If you have any questions, you can ask me. Um, so here I have Excel practice that you can go over on how to plot a normal distribution. We're not gonna cover that in class because I'm trying to speed up a things a little bit. And then um, in the previous, um, the previous, uh, what do you say? What, how do I say this? The previous instructor, uh, she also taught Scilab. I'm not going to cover that in our class, only Excel and probably MATLAB. Okay. Properties of normal distribution. So now we're going to talk about the properties. We've talked about the mu, we've talked about the standard deviation. Remember, standard deviation that is smaller is closer to the mean. If it is bigger, it's far away, spread out mean just basically tells you where your maximum peak lies okay okay so moving on to this slide now the mode which is the point on the horizontal axis where the curve is a maximum occurs at x equals to mu okay so let's label that okay so the curve is symmetric about a vertical axis through the mean mu so it is symmetrical so i told you the probability the total probability of a normal curve is one so if it is symmetrical and mu is the average or the mean therefore you would have 0 0.5 over here and 0 0.5 over here symmetrical right uh and um okay the probability of x being greater than mu or the probability of x being less than mu is equal, which is 0 0.5. The curve has its points of inflection at x equal to mu plus minus standard deviation. So let's look at that. It is concave downward if mu minus standard deviation is less than, sorry, if x is greater than this and less than mu plus standard deviation, which is here and here, it is concave downward. Any concave, eh? If 
you don't remember, concave from physics. This is concave. No, no, there's no physics in this class. I'm just telling you a concave lens, okay? Concave downward, and if it is, uh, it is concave upward otherwise, like this. Okay, so going up, concave upward. This is what it means. Okay, so the normal curve approaches the horizontal axis asymptotically as we proceed in either direction from the mean. So asymptotically, which is very hard to pronounce, means that it approaches infinity, basically. So here you see that it's not ending at this point. It doesn't end here. There's a gap. Let's zoom in. There is a gap over there. It's not ending there. So basically, as it approaches minus infinity, it, see, I don't know, it tapers down or approaches the horizontal axis asymptotically, whatever that means. And the same case over here, it also extends up to infinity. Okay, so this is what it means when they say asymptotically in the textbook or whenever you're learning this in other courses. <clears throat> okay, uh, the total area under the curve and above the horizontal axis is equal to y. So this is straightforward. So here, since uh, standard normal distribution is pretty standard, so you can actually know what is the probability without even calculating it. So if you know what the mu and the standard deviation is, you can actually basically know what the probability is under that curve. So here, um, let's go over it a bit. Let me erase this. Okay. Uh, so our x goes from mu minus standard deviation, which is over here and here. So the, this, the probability under this curve, under this curve, and between this interval and this interval is 0 0.6827. So if you are going to find out what is the probability from the mu up to here, you can just basically divide it by two, symmetrical. And the same case over here, from here to here, the total is, oops, this is interval. Okay, so under this curve, it is 0 0.9545. So if you wanted to know uh, what is the value for this, how would you do it? First of all, divide it by two and then minus with whatever that you get over here. Okay, we're talking, we're gonna do exercises later on. Don't worry about that. And then from here to here is 0 0.9973. So here, you know that it, this is not one. So where does the one go come from? Comes from approaching the infinity asymptotically. Okay, so that gives you the one. <clears throat> okay, so does anyone have any questions for me before we proceed with the example? No questions? Everyone's okay? Easy stuff? 100% uh, in, in the exam? God willing. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, <clears throat> so here I have the proof uh, for the mean and also for the variance. My class is not a, a proofing class, so I'm not gonna test you on this one, but it is here in the slide if you just want to go over it, but not going to be tested on the exam. Okay, so areas under the normal curve. <clears throat> Wait, what time is it? 9.43, so let's take a seven minute break. Let's come back at 9.50 a.m. Get your drink, whatever, as long as you're awake. Come back at 9.50. If you have any questions, you can ask me now.
Okay, hopefully everyone is back. Oh, we have 57 people. For those who just came to class, please sign in attendance on Putra Blast. Don't forget. So I'm going to continue here. Okay, so let's continue with this one. I'm still recording, right? Yes. The area of any continuous probability or density function is constructed so that the area under the curve is bounded by two ordinates, x equals to x1 or and x equals to x2. So uh, previously, we talked about interval A and B. Here, they describe it as x1 and also x2. And x1 and x2 doesn't have to be between, I mean, like the mu does not have to be in this interval. Sometimes your x1 can be here, your x2 can be here or your x1 can be here, x2 can be here. doesn't really matter. It's just an interval. Uh, it doesn't have to be, it, the mu doesn't have to be within the interval. So the area under the curve bounded by the two ordinates equals the probability that the random variables x assume a value between x1 and x2. Thus, for the normal curve in figure 6. So this is figure 6 where the probability, we're trying to find the probability of x being from x1 to x2. So what is the probability of the random variable be having a value between x1 and x2? This is the probability. So how would we calculate that? We would integrate from x1 to x2, and you would integrate the normal distribution, which is the equation just now, which is PDF. And then PDF of this guy. This is our PDF. So when we integrate our probability density function or our PDF, we would get our cumulative. Oops, 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 sorry. So this is um, the equation that came from the PDF. And it is integrated from x1 to x2 with respect to dx. So you would get the area under this curve or within this region. Okay, so now we're going to continue with standard normal distribution. I told you standard normal distribution has a mean of equal to zero and the variance is equal to one. It is called the standard normal random variable and is denoted as Z. As Z. Typically, we would use the random variable X, right? But here they use the notation Z. The cumulative distribution function of a standard normal random variable is denoted with this guy. So whenever we... Uh, we try to find the cumulative distribution function. They denote it as, um, I don't know how to pronounce this Greek letter. And this is the probability of Z being less than or equal to some value Z. So let's say Z is equal to, uh, Z is a value less than or equal to one minus 1 1.5, for example. So how would I find out the cumulative distribution function? I use the table just like for Poisson uh, distribution function. Sorry, just like Poisson distribution. So this is the cumulative standard normal distribution table. Looks, looks rather complicated, but it's not. So here we have the value Z. Let me try to zoom in on this side first. Okay, I want everyone to focus uh, on how to use the table. So our table has Z values and the z values extend down here and also to the right. So how do we read it? So let's say my z value, I said it was 1.5. So how would I figure out the cumulative um, standard normal distribution? <clears throat> so 1.5, right? 1.5 is over here. And the decimal places is zero because I just specified 1.5. So basically the value is let me use a highlighter for this. Oops, this is too big. Basically, the value is still too big. This is the value. Because I specifically said my Z value is minus one. Oh, sorry, it was my minus 1.5, not 1.5. So I said 1.5, uh, minus 1.5, right? So this is not it. This is positive. Going to this side. And 1.5 minus 1.5 is down here. So the probability of my random variable being less than or equal to 
is 0 0.055917. So let's look at the graph again. So 0 0.055 0.005917. Okay, so, zero, so the area under this curve would be 0 0.005. Doesn't really look like it, right? But because my 1.5 is like this number, 1.5 is random. It's not, um, how do I say this? Up to scale with this graph. So let's see an actual example. Hopefully it makes much more sense than this one. Okay, example number two, given a standard normal distribution, standard, the word standard here, find the area under the curve that lies to the right of Z equals to 1.84. So we have our Z value as 1.84. We want to know what is the probability of our random variable having a value of greater than 1.84. So let's, I need to say Z, not X z being greater or equal to 1.84 so this is what you'll be trying to find so if i only have a table of cumulative distribution function how do i rephrase this question so that i can find this guy how do i rephrase this question So it would be one minus the probability of Z being greater or equal to 1.84. I have to minus one because what I'm trying to find is this guy, but the cumulative distribution function of 1.84 tells me this portion. It goes from here to here. Whoops. The cumulative distribution function tells me the probability from here to here. If I specify 1.84, this is what they're going to give me, which is not what I want. So how do I find this region instead? 1 minus the probability where Z is less than 1.84. Okay, so let's look at the table again. So Z is less than or equal to 1.84. 1.84 is a positive value. So I'm going to zoom in over here. I have 1.8 over here. So I'm going to highlight it over here. And then my decimal place is 1.84. 1.84 over here. So 0 0.967. 0 0.967. So what does that tell me? This portion is 0 0.967. This is what the table told me. At 1.9, sorry, 1.84, Z equal to 1.84, the value is 0 0.967. This is the probability of my variable having a value between here to 1.84. But this is not what I want. I want this portion, therefore, 1 minus 0 0.967. And I would get something which is 0 0.0, I don't know, what's the answer here? 0 0.0329. Three, two, nine. And it makes sense because it's very, very small. And it looks like a 0 0.0329. What if you get your answer and it is 0 0.5? Does that make sense? Does that look like a 0 0.5 to you? No. 0 0.5 would cover this entire region. So no, if I say the answer is 0 0.5, it is absolutely wrong because the region is just very small. Okay, so that's a way to check your answer. Okay, next one, between Z equals to one minus 1.97, which is here, and 0 0.89, which is over here. Again, when I use the cumulative distribution function table, what I'm getting is, if I look at 1.97, I am getting this region. I should use a highlighter because I need it to be transparent a bit. So this is the first region that I would get if I look at minus 1.97. Let's look at it. Minus 1.97. So it would be over here. 1.97. Oh, it's here. So 0 0.024. 0 0.024 is that region. 
let's write it 0 0.024. And what would be the region for 0 .0, sorry, 0 0.86? It would cover this portion. Let's use pink. It would cover, oh, that didn't show up. Mm, what would show up? Green. It will cover this up until here. It's going to overlap the region that we already got. Okay, so 0 .0, 0 0.86. The answer would be 0 0.86. Whoops. So it's um, 0 0.805. Okay, let's see. So this region would be 0 0.805. Does that make sense? It does because it's greater than 0 0.5 which is beyond the mean and yeah, it looks okay. So we want this region between here to here only. Therefore, I would, I would uh, subtract 0 0.805 with 0 0.024 to get this region. So pretty simple actually, 0 0.7807. Any questions about this one on how to use the table? So far, okay, Doctor. Am I going too fast or is this okay? It's just okay. This okay? All right. So if you want me to repeat any parts, please let me know. Okay, moving on to example number three. So given a standard normal distribution, find the value of k such that z is greater than k. The probability of z greater than k is 0 0.3015. So immediately, I know that this is supposed to be less than the mean oh sorry here they already labeled it so if they did not label it then it would be this over here okay so if they did not tell me that it was in this portion i can assume that it was in this portion but it will be equal zero point this one zero point three oh one five remember it is um symmetrical but since z is greater than k greater than k to be 0 0.305. So it makes sense that it is on this region. Okay, so p is, sorry, the probability of z being greater than k, so, and less than minus 0 0.18. So it is on the left side region because it has to be less than the mean, which is zero. This is the mean zero. So if it is a negative, it should be on the left side region and it is greater than k. So we immediately know that k has a negative value as well. Okay, so let's try to find out how to do this. Okay, I'm gonna call out someone um, to tell me how to do this. Can I ask Nadia Fitriana to help me for the first one? Nadia Fitriana, are you there? Yes, Nadia. Okay, so um, just a guess. How would you try to solve A? Using the table, how would you try to solve it? Any guesses? It doesn't have to be correct. It's okay, this is a discussion. So how would you try to attempt this question? Nadia, are you still there? I don't know. Okay, you don't know. So anyone else wants to help Nadia? Just guess. Okay, so I have someone in the chat. Let, let's read it. So use the table, yes, that was the first thing that I gave you. Use the table, but uh, how do you, what's the next step? How do you use the table? Okay, so we have 0 0.3015. What does the table tell me? If I say, okay, I have a normal curve, right? And I have you know, the value 1.5. If I look at the table where Z is minus 1.5, does the table tell me uh, the A region or the B region? The B region. B, the B region. Okay. 
So now look at this question. It's giving you 0 0.3015 and the value K. You need to find K. What do you do to find, to use the table? So you need to minus it with one. Minus it, one, one minus, minus 0.3015. So you would get the probability for K and you can relate it to the table. So I don't have, <coughs> I don't have my calculator. Wait. Uh, let me use my phone. So 0 0.31 minus 0 0.3015. So that would give me 0 0.6985. Okay, 0 0.6985. Let's do this together, okay? So now that I have 0 0.6985 probability and it is this region, right? Oh, I really don't like this uh, look. Let's use the highlighter. Uh, 0 0.6985 is given by this region. What's the next step? What's the next step? Anyone? One minus that probability. One minus that probability. Why should I minus it again? I would get 0 0.3015. Sorry, what was the question again? So if I already know that the probability for the purple region is 0 0.6895, how do I find K? Uh, I think that we can use the table to we retrace the back table. the zip. Okay, let's try that. So use the table and try to trace this value. So what do we know about K? Does K, is K a positive number or a negative number? Positive number. Positive number. So when we're using the table, we have to focus on the positive numbers. So K must be positive and it is 0 0.66. 6, sorry, I don't remember. 0 0.6895. Sorry, 0 0.985. I wrote that wrong. 0 0.985. Whoops. 985. And this is the region that we're looking at, even though they asked us this one. Okay, so 0 0.6985. The, let's try to find it. Let me zoom in a bit. Z must be a positive number. And we need to find the probability it is 0 0.6895. So this is going to be um, 6896. Sorry, 6985. So it's this number 0 0.52. 0.52. So Z is 0. Point, is it 0. 0.985? Yeah. So Z is 0. 0.52. Let's see if we got that right. Oops. Zero point eight nine five. Solution. Yay! We got it right. Okay, so K is indeed 0 0.52. So look, at, let's look at the uh, graph again. So it's a little bit uh, uh, away from the mean and the mean is zero. So we're trying to adapt our minds with uh, this graph, right? So zero is here and K, they said that this is 0 0.52. So if we know that this shape, sorry, this K is 0 0.52, so hopefully we will know that by the end of this module, we will know that this is greater than 0 0.52, let's say 0 0.7, 0 0.8, or etc. So I'm just trying to like have a mental picture of what 0 0.52 looks like or where it is located. So that would be helpful for us uh, when we're trying to attempt questions later on. Okay, so B, the probability of Z being greater than K and also less than Z minus 0 0.18. How do I find K in this case. Let me try to call someone. Um, Era, are you there Era? Is Era there? Era is not there. Calling Era. Okay, I feel like a DJ now. Okay, so next, um, Shamil. Is Shamil there? I 
Are you there, Shamil? Shamil is also not there. So Era and Shamil is not there. Where are they? Are they in the cafe eating? Okay, so um, can I call Siti Zara then? Is Zara there? Zara? Let me try it there. Who is that? Uh, let me see. Who was talking just now? Is it Shamil? Oh, so that person just decided. Me, that. me, I'm Amama. Okay, so Amma wants to try. So how would you attempt this question? Uh, what would be the first step? Question? Oh, first step. Yes. Yeah. So how would you attempt it? What would be the first step? To finding K. Uh, cari table. Eh, no. Okay. Cari table. Uh, so what, what am I looking at the table? 0.18 or 0 0.18. Uh, is it positive or negative? Negative. Negative. So 0 0.18. Let's look at this. Okay, this is where it is at. There's no decimal places after 0 0.8. So oh, this is 0 0.9. So we need to go for the 0 one. Oops. So it's 0 0.211. So Amar said, find using the table, uh, find the probability for 0. Point, minus 0 0.18. Eh, is it? This is not it. 0 0.18. So we got 0 0.22 and it would denote this region. Okay, thank you, Amar. So what is the next step, anyone? So purple region is 0 0.2, don't remember. 0 0.212. 0 0.212. So 0 0.212 is minus 0 0.18. 0 0.18. Why is it? Too small. Zero point two one two. Oh, this is zero point eight. My bad. It's zero point one eight. Zero point one eight. Yes. Okay. Zero point one eight. Zero point one. Where's zero point one eight? Minus zero point one eight. This zero point four two nine. 0.429. So that was an example of me making a mistake and I rectified myself by looking at the graph. Initially, I got 0.212, which is very, very small for something that almost occupies up until the mean. The mean is here and we're trying to find the probability of this guy, which is supposed to be close to 0.5, right? But this is only 0 0.212. So immediately I knew that I had to check back on my answer because it doesn't make sense. So the actual answer is, I look at the table wrong. So one, 0 0.18, where is it? Oh, 0 0.429 is the answer. 0 0.429, but we're not done yet. So this is the probability for that guy. And we need to know we need to subtract 0 0.429 with 0 0.4197. And when we do, we will get this region. 0 0.429 minus 0 0.4197. So I would get this region as 0 0.0093. So now I can look using Using the table, I can find out what is K.
0 0.0093. I'm looking at a negative value because k is negative. So 0. 0. Point, what was it just now? 0 0.0093. 0093. So it's around here, 0 0.0093 is over here, this one, which is minus 1.32. Minus 1.32 from here to here. 1.32, minus 1.32. Okay, so K is minus 1 point, minus 1.32. So let's look at the solution. Did we get it right? Oh, it's minus 2.37. Why is it different? 0 0.089. I got 0 0.093. 0 0.0093, 0 0.4286, I think it's because of the decimal places, 0 0.429, they got 0 0.4286, we, we rounded off to the third decimal place, and then also for this guy, I also, no oh wait, what was the answer here, 0 0.4197, I use it as it is. And the answer was 0 0.093. But for this one, they got 0 0.0089. Let's see. 0 0.0089 is 0 0.0089 is 1 point minus 1.35. It's not far off. Why is your answer different? Hmm. I think the answer is wrong. Let me see. We see that the node is equal to in figure 10. We see that the area between k and so that the area of level k must be this guy. Hence, yeah, I think this one is wrong. So the answer is the one. A. Yep. Uh is double zero. Where is double zero? Zero 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 eight nine. Tadi doctor cari zero eight nine. Oh, okay. So it's my mistake. Zero, zero. Oh, yes. You are correct. Zero, zero, eight, nine. Double, zero. Where is double, zero? Zero, zero, eight, nine. Zero, nine, three is what we're looking at. So it's this. Yeah. Okay. My bad. Okay, thank you for letting me know. So it's G minus 2.35 or if we're Doctor, using... Yep. 0, 0. 0.89. I got it as 0. Point, okay, I'm trying to use my answer first. So 0, 0, 0.093. So I got minus 2.35. The But the solution says 0. 0.0089. So it's from here, 2.3 to 2.7. So it's close. So depending on where you round off your answer, it can be between that. So 2.3 is the 2.35 up to 2.357 or the minus 2.37 up to minus 2.35 would be the accepted answer because depending on the decimal places. So if, um, would I specify the decimal places in the answer? I don't think so. So 2.3 is the answer, basically. Okay, so I hope that makes sense for everyone. Sorry, uh, I did a mistake in reading the table. NT. Uh, yes, Amar, what is it? What is NT? What, what, nice what? try. Nice try. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, I never had a student say nice try to me. Okay, mm, moving on. So these are other standard normal random variable examples. And I think it would be really helpful if you can go through this on your own. Basically, it tells you that uh, this region is equal to one minus this region. And this region is just this region as it is. Finding this region is basically um, the flip of this guy. So the area for this guy, minus 1.37, is actually the same as if it is positive. So this is something that we did not cover in class. I need you, I need you guys to read this yourself. And then from here, 
if you're trying to find this region, basically you need to find the all of this region first minus with this region to get the middle part. Uh, basically, it tells you how to approach problems, lah. Okay, so hopefully you can read that on your own time because it's very simple. Okay, so it's ten twenty one. Um, okay, I'm going to talk about this one first and then we're going to take a seven minute break. Okay, so moving on to the next part, still the same uh, normal distribution, but now instead of talking about standard normal distribution, we are going to standardize our arbitrary normal random variable to become standard. So how do we do that? Remember that I told you sometimes we use normal distribution for a lot of cases, a lot of phenomena, and sometimes we use it for grades and your grades, the average is around 75, let's see. So 75 for the mean is obviously not a zero, whereas for the standard, the mean is equal to zero. And of course, for your grades, the variance is not equal to one, but for the standard, the variance is equal to one. So how do we standardize this guy so that we can use the cumulative distribution function table for our use so that we don't have to use the calculator? So if x is a normal random variable with a mean of mu and variance of this guy, the random variable z is equal to x minus mu over standard deviation. So this is how you would standardize your normal distribution. So suppose x is a, so here your, if you have a probability x, which does not align with the numbers given in the table, which is z, this is how you can convert it to Z. Convert. So your value would be minus the mean over the standard deviation. So we're going to talk about the, uh, this one in, in a bit in the examples where Z is a standard normal random variable and Z is given by X minus mu over standard deviation is the Z value obtained by standardizing X. Okay. So let's look at this example or like this figure first. So this is our standard distribution or standard normal distribution. And this is our arbitrary normal distribution. The mean is zero. And we're trying to find what is 13 when we translate it to Z. What is 13 when we translate it to Z? Why do we want to translate it? Because we need to use the table. So 13 minus the mean, which is 10, over the standard deviation. Here, the standard deviation is not given, so I don't really know. But here, they tell me that 13 is equal to 1.5. So I can say, okay, so it's 1.5. So 13 minus 10 is 3. 3 divided by 1.5 is 2. So the standard deviation is equal to 2. So that is it. This is how you translate it, basically. So here, if you're translating other values in this arbitrary normal distribution to the standard one, uh, this is this is they already map it out. So 13 becomes 1.5, 16 becomes 3, uh, 9 becomes minus 0 0.5, 7 becomes minus 1.5, etc. And all of these are obtained using this equation. We already found what is the standard deviation, right? So we can just apply it. Let's try to convert this. So 4 minus 10, which is the mean, divided by the standard deviation, which is 2. So 4 minus 10 is 6. 6 divided by 2 is 3. So this is minus, minus 6 divided by 2 is minus 3. So you would get in the standard normal distribution, the value 4 is actually a minus 3. So if you were to refer to the table, this value exists. Okay. Okay, so this is an example of the original and transform normal distribution. So x1 uh, to x2, this value does not exist in the table. So you transform it to z to become z1 to z2. And after transformation, your standard deviation will be equal to 1. This can be whatever number as long as it is greater than 0. And after transformation, it will be equal to 1. So don't calculate that. 
Okay, what time is it? Okay. Um, I'm going to stop class here, not, not end class. I'm going to uh, take a break over here. And let's come back to 10.32 a.m. when we're going to finish up the rest. We have one more distribution to go. So if you have any questions, you can ask me. Otherwise, please take your break and come back. 10.32.
Okay, is everyone back? Hopefully you guys are uh, still with this class. Let's continue. I need to share my screen. Am I still recording? Yes. Okay, so back to example four on still normal standard, sorry, normal distribution. Now we have a situation where the normal distribution can be arbitrary and we want to standardize it so that the mean becomes zero and the Z value is something that we can refer to the table. So here, given a random variable X, having a normal distribution with mu equal to 50 and variance of, sorry, standard deviation of 10, find the probability that X assumes a value between 45 and 62. So we want to find X between 45 and 62, and we are trying to find the probability. But we cannot find the probability unless we use our calculator and integrate, and we don't want to do that because there is, there is an easy way to do this, which is transformation into Z. So if I were to transform this into Z, I would just have to find the probability from the table. So 45 minus mean, the mean is 50 divided by the standard deviation, which is 10. Z is, let me try to make this smaller, actually. How do I do this? Okay, let me try to group this. <clears throat> make this smaller. Hopefully we have more space now. Okay, back to this one, uh, 45 and 62. So 62 minus 50 divided by 10. And now my Z value is between, um, this is a minus five divided by 10 minus 0 0.5. 62 minus 50 is a 12, 12 divided by 10 is 1.2. So now my Z is 1.2 to 0 0.52 minus 0 0.5 to 1.2 which is this region. So now I can find the CDF for 1.2 region and then the CDF for my zero, minus 0 0.5 region and, that, and then subtract these two together to find the middle part. Okay, so fairly easy, I think. Um, if you have any questions, you can ask me. Otherwise, I think it's straightforward. Moving on to the same solution. Example number five, given that X has a normal distribution with mu equal to 300 and standard deviation of 50, find the probability that X assumes a value greater than 362. So now we're trying to find this region. We have to transform 362 to become Z. And then from Z, we get the, we get the one, sorry, we get the um, probability value. And then the probability value would be one minus whatever that value is. I can't use X something. Okay, so let's try to convert this value first to Z. 362 minus 300 divided by 50. I will get 62 divided by 50. That's a fraction. My brain does not deal with fraction. So that is 62 divided by 50, 1.24. So Z is 1.24. So if I were to transform this, this is 0, 1.24. So now I want to find what is the value for 1.24 in the table. And to find this region, 1 minus this region value, whatever that is. So let's see what they did here. 1 minus 0 0.8925. So you would get 0 0.1075, which makes sense. It's not supposed to be greater than 0 0.5 because it's small. Okay, moving on to the next example. Given a normal distribution with mu equals to 40 and standard deviation of six, find the value of X that has 45% of the area to the left and 14% of the area to the right. So when you are talking about percentage, it basically means probability because 100% is basically Sorry, when we're talking about percentage, we're talking about something that is um, that has a total of one. So we're not necessarily talking about probability, but this value can translate into decimal uh, or into fraction. 
which is what we're talking about when we're dealing with statistics. So this is one, right? So 45% would be 0 0.5 and 14% would be 0 0.14. So 45% is 0 0.45 probability. It means that we're talking about the region, not Z. And same case over here, this is also the probability value. So now we're going to look at the table, find the value 0 0.45 to find out what is our Z and then convert it to our X. So let's try that, 0 0.45. Um, which is less than 0 0.5. So the Z value should be a negative 0 0.45, 0 0.45 over here, 0 0.45 <clears throat> minus 0 0.4. Sorry, I'm trying to find the probability, not the Z value. 0 0.45, but Z has a negative value. 0 0.45 over here or here it's between these values. So it's minus 0 0.1, let's just go with three, 0 0.1, minus 0 0.13. Okay, going back to the example. So Z is 0 0.1, I already forgot, 0 point, what was it just now? 0 0.1, 0 0.45 was where is it? We should have circled it. Where is here? 0 0.45, which is 0 0.1 0 0.13. Okay. 0 0.13. Okay, 0. Point minus 0 0.13. And now we have to convert our z into our x, which is if our z is equal to x minus mu over standard deviation, we're just going to flip this equation. So zero minus 0 0.13 times with the standard deviation, which is six. And then I would put this on the other side and plus with 40 to get my x. So you can do that yourself. And the same case for this one, 14% of the area to the right, one minus 0 0.14, that would give me one minus 0 0.14, 0 0.86. So I'm going to find a value X, sorry, a value Z that has the value 0 0.86 and then convert it into X. Okay, so this is the solution. You can look at it later. Um, these are example applications. You can also refer to it. I'm going to go over to the next distribution, which is exponential distribution. So all the examples and the solutions are going to be given in the slide, which is available on Pushra Blast. So please look at that, revise. Okay, exponential distribution, what does it tell us? So if the normal distribution tells us um, where our mean is or where, where the maximum of our probability is going to be, which is always at the mean, and the mean can be anything really, the exponential distribution tells us about the lifetime of a food, of, we don't say lifetime for food, we, sell, we say shelf life of food, lifetime of a component, what else? The time until something happens. So these are examples of lifetime that follows exponential distribution. So the time until the computer locks up, the time between arrivals of the telephone calls, the lifetime of a component until it fails, the shelf life of a fruit before it expires. So these things or um, anything that has a failure um, period or a waiting time before it fails, it usually typically follows the exponential distribution. So exponential distribution, of course, follows an exponential. So exponential distribution can be used to model the amount of time until a specific event occurs or to model the time between independent events. So this time is called the waiting time before something happens. 
it has a property known as lack of memory property. Where we are going to look at this in a bit. The exponential distribution is a special case of the gamma distribution. We're not going to learn about gamma distribution. But we're going to go over it a little bit just to give you an idea. So the gamma function is given by this one. It is the integration between 0 to infinity x alpha minus 1 exponential to the power of minus x um, integrated with respect to x for alpha greater than 0. So this is how the curve looks like. So when alpha is equal to 1, which is this guy over here, when alpha is equal to 1, what you get is x to the power of 0, which is just 1. So you are left with e to the power of minus x. So when alpha is equal to 1, you would get this curve, which is an exponential. Whereas if your alpha is not equal to 1, you would get these other curves, which are not relevant to our exponential distribution. So our exponential distribution is given by this equation. The probability density function is uh, with parameter lambda greater than zero. So we have our e to the power of minus x, but now we're adding the lambda into our equation or the gamma distribution just now that we saw. Um, the, the lambda is basically a constant whose value determine the function's location and shape. So it's a constant and typically it will be, it will be given. Okay, so this applies for x greater than zero, only for x greater than zero. Otherwise it is non-existent or zero. So our x, if we have a random variable x that follows exponential distribution with parameter lambda, the cumulative distribution function of x would be the integration of this guy, but we're not going to do that. So we can just memorize this equation or this equation will be given in the exam. 1 minus e to the power of minus lambda x when x is greater than 0. Now remember your exponential distribution is always positive x, whereas for normal, it is negative and positive. So please make that distinction. If your x has follows an exponential distribution lambda, therefore your mu would be 1 over lambda and your variance would be 1 over lambda squared. So uh, really easy equation and really easy shape as well. It's just an exponential. So this is an example of um, an application that follows the exponential distribution. I want everyone to focus here. So the lifetime of a particular integrated circuit has an exponential distribution with mean of two years. So the mean is two. Remember what was the equation just now? Mu is equal to one over lambda. Therefore, our lambda would be 0 0.5. Oops, sorry. I skipped steps. So lambda would be one over mu, which is one over two, which is 0 0.5. So that is our mu, I'm sorry, this is our lambda. Find the probability that the circuit lasts longer than three years. So we're trying to find the probability of x being greater or equal last longer. Longer is greater than three. So the probability of x being greater than three. So since um, it's hard to know three up to infinity, we would rephrase this question to find out one minus the probability of x being less than or equal to three. So this is how we would rephrase the question. If the question asks us, uh, what is the probability from three to infinity? What is the probability of x to infinity? You would always, always rephrase this question to become one minus the probability of x being less than the value that they wanted. You have to rephrase this question in order for you to uh, solve this easily. Okay, so we have it over here and the probability follows exponential distribution and we know the equation is e to the power of, we are going to follow the CDF because we are trying to find uh, less than or equal to three. So this is from zero to three, right? So it follows a CDF. So this is 1 minus e to the power of minus lambda x. 
1 minus e to the power of minus lambda x. So this is the equation. But since you are minusing, sorry, you are subtracting from 1. So this one is subtracted with the 1. So you are left with just e. e to the power of, uh, to the, to the power of minus 1.5. And just use your calculator. Okay, so this was the first example. I'm going to go over the next example to show you what it means for it to be memoryless for the property of the exponential distribution. I said that it is lacking of memory. So what does that mean? So we're going to uh, explore that by comparing these two different examples. Now refer to the previous example. We're still talking about the integrated circuit. Okay, we're still talking about the integrated circuit. Assume the circuit is now four years old and is still functioning. Find the probability that it functions for more than three additional years. Compare this probability. Compare this probability with the probability that a new circuit functions for more than three years, which was the earlier question. This was what we were trying to find earlier on. And we already found out what was the probability. Now we are trying to find the probability of it functioning for more than three additional years after it being four years old. So seven lah. Um, we're trying to find x greater than seven because four plus three. Okay, again, the question is telling you the circuit is already four years old. It's asking you if it, if it can function additional with an additional three years for an additional three years so that would make the age of the circuit seven years okay so p probability of t being greater than seven given that it is already greater than four so you would rephrase you would write the equation like this we have seen this in module i forgot the module i think it's module five or six module six so if t greater than 7, then t is also greater than 4, right? Basically means the same thing. Therefore, probability of t being greater than 7 and t being greater than 4 is just probability of t being greater than 7. It follows that. So we just, um, we just uh, substitute the exponential distribution for this guy and for this guy. This part, you have to revise the previous module. But we already have up until this probability, probability of t being greater than 7 divided by probability of t being greater than 4. So you divide these two guys together. So just substituting lambda as 0 0.5 and your x as 7. And this one's lambda as 0 0.5 and your x as uh, 4. Sorry, this is not 3. And dividing these two would be just 7 minus 4, basically. So e to the power of minus 0 0.5 times 3. So you would get the same answer as before. So the probability that a four-year-old circuit lasts three additional years is exactly the same as the probability that a new circuit lasts three years. So this is what they mean when it is memoryless because they assume that the four-year-old circuit is like the new one because you are just looking at additional three, right? Additional three from T that is already four. So the value three is the common denominator here. And it didn't care whether the circuit is new or old. They just wanted to find the probability of the additional years. So that is what the memory layers property is. Okay, it can come out on in the exam. All right, so that is it for today's class. I hope uh, everything makes sense. If not, please try to revise. If you have any questions, you can ask me. Um, otherwise, have a great rest of the day and I'll see you tomorrow. Take care, guys. Bye. Any questions? No questions? Everyone's just like hung over from the class because there's a lot of content. Okay, bye, guys. Thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor.
Thank you, doctor. Welcome. Bye bye. Oh, I have a question. I'm so sorry. Oh no, there's no question. Uh, petang ni ada makanan ke? Uh, ada kot. Ada kot. Ada. But not kambing golik lah. Okay, bye. Thank you, doctor. Yee, yeah, ada makanan baru doctor. Thank you, doctor. Okay, bye. Thank you, doctor. Tak ada kambing golik, okay? Tak ada. Okay, bye.